I'm at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, the home of NASA and the hub of all things space. Behind me is the actual Apollo 11 command capsule. It made Neil Armstrong the first man on the moon. This was amazing, but the real engineering comes in how this capsule brought Armstrong and his crew safely down to Earth. The key to all of this is the exchange of energy. When it goes up, the ball is transferring kinetic energy into potential, and on the way down, potential back into kinetic. This is the same for rockets, when we have launch and return to Earth. We added energy to the system by using five rocket engines. All of this energy has now got to be removed, preferably before we hit the ground. Friction is part of the solution, but the majority of deceleration is actually from bow shock. The air in front of the capsule just can't get out of the way fast enough and it gets compressed, becoming almost like a brick wall and rapidly decelerating the capsule. Compressing air also comes with another problem, heat. I have here a can of compressed air used to clean the dust off computers. Just like with a can of deodorant, when I press the button, the air is allowed to expand. I also have an infrared camera. Hotter areas are shown in red, while cooler areas in blue. Look closely at the container and its surrounds when we allow the air inside to escape. You can see how the container cooled down. That's not because wind is cold or because there was any water evaporating. That's because it takes energy for air particles to get spread apart. What type of energy? Heat energy. Expanding gases cool down. Compression is the opposite of expansion. Rather than cooling down, compressed gas will heat up. On re-entry, temperatures reach 3,000 degrees Celsius, hot enough to melt an iron meteorite and vaporize an astronaut in seconds. NASA had to invent a heat shield. A heat shield works by combining a high latent heat diffusion with an equally high heat capacity. This means that it takes a lot of energy to heat the material up and then even more to make it evaporate. NASA uses a special type of acrylic for this purpose, but water has some very similar properties. I filled up two balloons, one with air and the other one with water. We're going to expose them to a 2000 degree propane torch to see what happens. As you can see, the balloon pops almost immediately. That's because the air has a very low heat capacity, meaning that it heats up very quickly when exposed to the torch. Let's see what happens with the water. All right, here we go. It's been about three minutes now and the balloon still hasn't exploded. That just shows you how effective water is at being a heat shield. So two things were going on here. First of all, the water has a very high heat capacity, meaning that it takes a lot of energy for it to heat up. We also had some pinholes forming, which allowed a little bit of the water to escape. This is just like the ablative shielding on a spacecraft, taking away some of the really hot bits to ensure the main body stays cool. Now that we know it isn't going to burn up on re-entry, we need to find a way to stop our capsule from tumbling out of control. We need to devise a shape that stabilizes itself, even at high speed. This is a one in a million find. The Bremen main mass meteor is an oriented palisite. This means that unlike almost every other type of meteor that falls to Earth, it didn't spin when it came in, instead staying stable and face on. This dome, sculpted by the heat of re-entry, it's perfect for retaining aerodynamic stability. If it tilts downwards too far, then more air is deflected in this direction, generating lift to bring it back up. Tilting up too far, and the lift acts downwards, keeping the meteor pointed in the direction of travel. Almost like a blueprint delivered to us from the gods, the NASA engineers based the Apollo capsule design off of this meteor. By combining heat shielding and aerodynamic stability, the Apollo capsule brought these first explorers safely down to Earth. Massive thank you to everyone who made this video possible, and in particular, the incredible team at NASA. Next month, we return to Perth Science, so make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. In the meantime, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up. <laughs>